everybody. So thank you for coming to my uh, little impromptu celebration event. Um, I just had the idea to do it about a month or so ago when I learned that uh, this was the 100th anniversary of Voltaren Declare's death. Uh, and since I'm sure some of you at least do not know who she is, I'm going to have a short uh, recalling of her life, uh, sort of an introductory speech. And then if anyone from the audience wants to actually chime in and talk about how they feel about her or anything they've learned or any of the sort of subjects that are related to her life, they're more than welcome to. Otherwise, it'll just be the speech and then, then that'll be it. Um, we, we also have uh, Volterine, Volterine Declares, um, which was my, my girlfriend's idea, for 125 a piece. Um, and uh, she would really appreciate it if uh, <clears throat> you would uh, give money to her. Um, so, that's that. Um, so, for point of reference, I have, I've have an earlier presentation that I've not put on YouTube yet, unfortunately, uh, called the, the, the Glow of Legend, uh, the life of Voltaren Declare or something like that. And I've not put it up on YouTube, but I eventually will, and it'll be like a two-hour presentation. Um, so that'll be on my YouTube channel, Rage Against the Clampdown. But for now, um, I have a lot of her material. So this is Voltaren Declare herself. I'm um, not sure well you can see that, but so um, this is her biography by Paul Average. It's, a, it's an invaluable resource if you want to actually learn about her. It's sadly out of print, but you can still get it, of course, like anything, almost anything else from Amazon. Um, this is the Voltaren Declare Reader. These two are a collection of her essays, and this one actually has some independently made essays. We're also selling pamphlets that have Voltaren Declare on them, and they're very nice. They have Anarchism in American Traditions, which is an essay that talks about um, how actually uh, the Americans with uh, their sort of revolutionary war could have actually led to um, to anarchism or individualist sort of anarchism uh, in the style of other people like Benjamin Tucker and Lysander Spooner uh, and so on. Uh, there's also Individualism and Communism, a dialogue which is a very uh, innovatively sort of uh, dialogue. It's presented very much as a conversation between uh, an individualist and a communist obviously and um, they're talking about how they differ and how they actually are more alike than they think. A glance at communism is just, uh, Voltaren always was very skeptical of communism and she always thought it, it was really way too strict and administrative. Um, so she felt like, um, she didn't think communists couldn't be anarchists, but she was always wary of them. Uh, but she was wary of the individualists too. Uh, and then the economic tendency of free thought, which is probably w one of the best introductions to Voltaren's comprehensive thought. It, it, although it's talking about her atheism, uh, she brings in her anarchism and her feminism in it too, in a lot of different points and basically kind of combines them in a sort of three-pronged attack on society. So it's very well done, and it's probably one of the best introductions to her, um, to her thought. So we have these. They're pretty low-priced. So anyway, I want to recall in brief uh, the life and death of Voltaire and Claire, and uh, I want to be brief, uh, mostly because I've already talked about this before, um, but um, it's, it's not because I don't want to tell the whole story of who she is or I don't have the knowledge to or anything like that, because honestly I could go on and on about how I, re I really think Voltaire is a really interesting character and I think that um, she's a really important anarchist to look to when we look to our history as libertarians or, or especially as anarchists but uh, even libertarians in general um, but I do want to keep it short um, because I feel like other people should talk about their um, their feelings on, on Voltaire and Declare once they've actually heard about her in her life uh, and also if they know anything by her or, or they have any of her works or anything like that um, so I, I want to, you know, just have a sort of somber reflection on her life and her death, this being her 100th anniversary of her death. She died uh, 1912, um, I don't remember the, ex the uh, well, June 20th. So it's pretty fitting that this is actually a pork fest, so I'm pretty happy about uh, that in a way. So I think uh, a lot of her uh, her life is not very uplifting. Uh, she left a very, She lived a very kind of... Uh, very tough life. She was chronically sick with um, something that she got um, through uh, genetics. Um, so she always had kind of a weak constitution about her. Uh, but we can learn a lot from, I think, her experiences and what she talked about. So, um, so first things first, uh, I want to talk about who actually was Voltaire Claire. So Voltaire Claire, who, which originally was spelled C L A I R E before she actually changed it to her uh, C L E Y R E, which is what's known now uh, in her early adulthood. Now, I, I average isn't average. Her biographer uh, isn't really sure why she did this, 
but he thinks it's to distance herself from her father um, who put her in a convent um, when she was younger and I'll get into that later in a little bit actually but um, so her father uh, was uh, was a lover what was a really liked uh, Voltaire uh, and he was in love basically with free thought and liberalism and socialism in his early years when he lived in uh, France and so he chose to name her uh, as sort of the female version if you will of Voltaire's name which is Voltairine um, so uh, she was uh, even early on in her life as her sister Adelaide put very brilliant she was pretty much Adelaide even went so far as to call her a genius she taught her how to read at the age of four pretty comprehensively um, and was applying to the local school um, to be let in but was refused because she was too young um, so she was pretty indignant about this um, but she got admitted uh, the next year um, and stayed until she was about 12 when her father split from her family now there are actually reasons in the to talk about why her father split from her family, which is up to, but not including, her uh, elder sister's uh, drow accidental drowning years earlier. Um, so that led to kind of a rift in the family that started to open up as money troubles happened. So her father went there to get work, um, and she was put with her father, and she was sent to Our Lady of Port Huron, which is a convent, uh, probably one of the best and most expensive convents in the area. Now this was a very pivotal time in Voltaire's life. It proved to probably be one of the most important. Uh, indeed, in her essay, The Mar Making of an Anarchist, she states explicitly that her time in the convent was, quote, the ultimate reason for my acceptance of anarchism. Paul Average, her biography, her biographer, an otherwise notable anarchist historian, said that, quote, being a former pupil in a convent, she was a particularly effective speaker as she could talk from first-hand experience like the runaway slaves who addressed abolitionist gatherings before the Civil War. Which is further exemplified by Voltaire in what she says in her speech, Secular Education. She said, quote, I know of what I speak. I spent four years in a convent, and I've seen the watchwords of their machinations. I have seen bright intellects loaded down with chains made of jet prostrate non-entities. I've seen frank, generous dispositions made morose, sullen, and deceitful. And I've seen rose-leaf cheeks turn to a sickly pallor and glad eyes lose their brightness and elastic youth lose its vitality and go down to an early grave, murdered, murdered by the church. Um, so she was very passionate, as you can see, about... Uh, this time in her life and, and the sort of effect that it had on her and it made her very much despise um, religion in general but especially Catholicism um, which was the specific uh, convent that it was um, so I will explain actually why I call her the priestess of anarchism why others have later because it seems pretty weird now seeing that she doesn't like religion but I'll explain that as we go along so this fiery rhetoric however was actually not Voltaire's, uh exact style or if she didn't deliver it. Uh, her time in the convent though was pr made this sort of fiery rhetoric pretty justified. It was extremely regulated as you might imagine. Her day was planned out in advance, her mail checked and censored, a forced curriculum and a dogma that her soul simply could not adjust to in any meaningful way and um, she simply couldn't communicate with her family very well and they were very overbearing towards her. Um, so Voltaire, in a sense, it seems, was seemingly destined for rebellion from the start as soon as she was uh, put in the convent. And she certainly did, did rebel. Eventually she would get tired of the convent early on and she would cross the river back to Port Huron and hike uh, 20 miles only to make the mistake of asking some relatives to ask for help and let her stay, have some food and stuff. Because you've got to imagine she had basically only the basic sort of clothes on her. She had just about no money um, and she just had basically hiked 20 miles only only for to ask for relatives to help her out and give her a place to stay but instead of helping her they turned her into her father um, so she had to go all the way back or with her father I presume um, so her so her father took her back after this Voltaire's uh, spirit of basically pure fire and uh, dislike of the convent went down but only temporarily uh, in, inside her she actually never lost her will to fight and eventually she would rebel again uh, but not in quite such a huge way. So from these experiences it led, as we've already seen from that quote, powerful denunciations of the church and religion, which led her to getting many circuit tours and speeches after she, after she left the convent. Um, from that time she would become interested in the ideas of the plight of the working class and state socialism being via speeches she heard at some of the free thought gatherings. Um, what you have to understand is that at free thought speech, at free thought groups, a lot of them had uh, sort of radical groups with them, um, because you know if you're 
radical in one area, you tend to be kind of radical in other areas too, and so you tend to attract other groups that are radical in other areas. So the ideas of socialism, anarchism, state socialism, whatever, um, tended to be in those groups as well. Uh, but at one of those, at one of the debates after she started calling herself a socialist, a few weeks later, she would uh, get into a debate uh, with um, a, a, a Jewish anarchist um, who would basically make her fall into all these pitfall, pitfalls of logic, and she could not, as she said herself, extol them without or get herself out of it without falling into another one. Um, so she continued to search for more on anarchism after he, she talked to him. Uh, she came upon Benjamin Tucker and his uh, then an up-and-coming individualist anarchist with his publication Liberty. Uh, this led to her becoming associated with Dyer D. Lum, who for five years was something of a mentor, a confidant, and an off-again, on-again, off-again, off-again lover of hers. Um, they formed a powerful relation that lasted until his death, which was tragically only five years after their friendship. Um, he died... Uh, I believe from suicide, uh, and deepened her respect for what she would eventually call an anarchist. She would eventually call herself an anarchist without adjectives. Uh, in her earlier years, she was she did consider herself an individualist anarchist, um, but later on, she did tend to think that the the focus of individuals was too narrow. Um, she worried about uh, the sort of police that she felt that they would have for property. She wasn't sure how they could um, advocate so much private property and. Uh, on the wholesale, without having some sort of police, some sort of police—not exactly state police, but any type that's likened to a police force—having uh, to protect it. So she was, she was, uh, you know, nervous about that. She had a concern about that. Uh, now, whether she was right or not is another question, but she certainly wasn't an individualist anarchist even late into the 1890s. Um, so some of my fellow left libertarians and anarchists will talk about how she was an individualist anarchist, but. I think for the point of clarity, it's, it's good to say that she was individualist earlier on, but her anarchist without adjectives was just open to individualism. She wasn't individualist. Um, so I actually want to talk about anarchists without adjectives. I didn't write anything to expound upon it here, but just very briefly, anarchists without adjectives, at least with Voltaire Claire, basically takes into consideration what she calls the axiom of anarchism. And what that is to her, uh, and I think it's a very important concept, is that Everything comes from the presumption that the liberty of the individual is the most important thing. And insofar as we favor that, we must disfavor the state, which eventually must lead to its disillusion once we realize that the state is incompatible with the individual's freedom. So from that presumption, uh, all other economic organizations follow. Um, whether you're communist, individualist, socialist, mutualist, whatever, um, she thought from that presumption, everybody basically becomes some sort of anarchist. So she thought the presumption or the axiom of anarchism was the most important to talk about, the most important to argue about. Everything else is secondary. Now that's not to say it's not important. It is important to talk about what economic models we prefer and which we think we'll see in a truly free society. But it's secondary to, to the importance of anarchism itself. Because if we're not talking about uh, getting rid of the government, and obviously government's not the only oppressive institution, but it's probably one of the most important oppressive institutions in current day society. Um, if we're not talking about that, then there's really no point to talk about what sort of economic models um, we want. So that's the basics of the anarchism without adjectives, at least in Declare's sense. There are other anarchists that, without adjectives. There is a school of thought called synthesis anarchism, which is kind of like it. Um, so, and if you have any more any questions, you know, just write them down or just hold them till the end. So, um, like many people, though, the biggest influence on Voltairine for anarchism was in the late 19th century, and it was the Haymarket Affair that really did it for Voltairine. This event took place on May 4th, 1886, during a labor demonstration in Chicago. It was raining, people were starting to disperse, and the last speaker was on the stage, so it didn't look like anything was going to happen. Then the police came up to the speaker and asked him to step down. The speaker protested, simply maintaining that it was just a peaceful protest. Then a bomb was thrown. Seven police officers would die from the explosion. I've actually seen a, d a few different figures, though they don't w vary widely. Um, and uh, uh, four citizens uh, would be killed as well, wounding many others. So this in turn caused several people to accuse of the crime. Most of the people who weren't even there to begin with and demonstrably could have been proven to not be there. Um, but August spies, Albert Parsons, Samuel Fielden, Louis Ling, Adolf, Adolf Fischer, Michael Schwab, George Engel, and Oscar Nieb. Now no one to this day actually knows who threw the bombs, uh, who threw the bomb, but you know there, there are many theories. 
Um, but the subsequent trial seems to be clearly a show to put anarchy on trial. One of the newspapers actually said that anarchism itself was on trial here. So clearly there's a sort of self-serving bias going on. Um, and the newspapers raved about how wild and how violent the last speech was about... Uh, and this was what's interesting is that the speech was completely passive. No one was advocating for some social revolution or violence or anything, as far as I know. Um, and so, basically, the anarchists there were presumed uh, guilty before innocent, which, of course, isn't new to us today. Now the government's doing this in general uh, with anybody, not just anarchists, although they'll especially do it to anarchists if you look at the Ohio Four who were framed for uh, bombing, um, bombing, you know, bombing the bridge, even though they were completely set up and the FBI gave them the materials and said, oh, wouldn't that be cool? And they did the same thing for uh, the Chicago G8. So, they, they always, you know, they have their tricks. Um, so, and this was, of course, nothing to say about the judge, who basically had a bias about the Haymarket uh, martyrs, or they eventually become martyrs. Uh, do, I'm pretty sure he was heard speaking about uh, them being subsequently hanged. He was pretty excited about the notion of the anarchists being hanged. Now, when Volturing glanced over the title, Anarchists Throw Bomb, People Killed, she cries, she cried, they ought to be hanged. But later, when she became an anarchist, she was not an anarchist at the time, of course, she deeply regretted these words, and this is sort of where the priestess comes in. On the 14th anniversary of the execution, this was 14 years later, and she's still saying that, so keep that in mind. Volturing still had this regretful attitude. She said, quote, For that ignorant, outrageous, bloodthirsty sentence, I shall never forgive myself. Though I know the dead men would have forgiven me, though I know those who loved me, them for forgive me, but my own voice as it sounded that night will sound, will sound so in my ears till I die, a bitter reproach and shame. So some pretty hardcore stuff in, in terms of wanting to make penance and wanting to uh, sort of atone for her so-called sin, if you will, of um, basically judging without actually getting to know anything. Uh, and they were hanged. Um, so she felt that it was, not all of them were hanged, I believe five out of the seven or four out of the seven were hanged. Um, and then three of them, I think, were pardoned. And she, she dedicated a poem to the governor who did it. Actually, this was heroic. The governor lost his, jo his job to pardon the remaining three because he knew it wasn't right. Um, so kudos to him. Um, but as years passed, Volturing increasingly become more, more broad in her views, as I talked about before. Past the early years of her anarchism in the 20th century, Volturing would soon call herself an anarchist with adjectives, which is something she, at least to my knowledge, never explicitly re rebuked for the remainder of her life. And Volturing's principles were always a part of her and who she was. And they were actually never more under, under a, a sort of test than when she was shot three times by a former, former pupil of hers named Herman Helcher on December 19, 1902. Helcher later claimed after, she, after he shot her that Volturing had broken his heart, made him lose his job, and had done other various injuries to him. Now the claims were, for the most part, egregious and um, uh, wrong. Uh, and baseless. Helcher was a man of considerable trouble, mentally speaking, and indeed still held the job that he had always had at the factory, uh, but had blamed Volturine because he, uh, she had, uh, according to him, crushed his heart. So Volturine was shot once through the head, uh, the chest, excuse me, not the head, and twice in the back, and merely through a cold and resolute will to live through, did she actually, uh, three days later, make, to make a recovery. She actually, um, how was she th shot? Basically, Helter, and I don't explain this, so that's my fault, but Helter uh, walked up to Volturine, I think, from behind, and like grabbed her shoulder, and she spun around, and as she spun around, he shot her once, and the bullet actually made her spin around again, and she, he shot her twice more. Um, and actually, he just stood there, I think, after he shot there. I'm pretty sure he didn't leave the scene, because he was, I mean, he was pretty much mentally ill. Um, yeah, she took three bullets, one to the chest and two to the back, and they were actually never removed from her body. Yeah, well, 50 cent, eat your heart out, right? Um, so Volturine was shot in the chest and twice in the back, like I said, and merely through a cold and resolute will did she not die. She was in basically something of a coma for three days, and she later stated that she felt like her friend suffered a lot more than she did. Um, but what did Volturine do now? Clearly it was very a very easy case just to uh, abscond from her um, anarchist principles and just sue him or get money from him. I mean, she lived a pretty uh, desperate and poor life. She was never wealthy at all, uh, which is another thing I'll get into. She lived a very ascetic lifestyle, something in the, in the sort of lifestyle of a priestess. Um, 
But what, but what did Voltaren say? Well, instead of targeting the would-be assassin, she actually defended him. She said, quote, Dear comrades, I write to appeal to you on the behalf of the unfortunate child, for an intellect has never been more than a child, who made the assault upon me. He is friendless, he is in prison, he is sick. Had he not been sick in the brain, he would never have done this thing. Nothing can be done to relieve him until a lawyer is secured, and for that money is needed. I know it is hard to ask, for our comrades are always giving more than they can afford, but I think this is a case where all anarchists are concerned that they would may learn our ideas concerning the treatment of so-called criminals, and that they will therefore be willing to make an even unusual sacrifices. What this poor, half-crazed boy needs is not the silence and cruelty of prison, but the kindness, care, and sympathy which heal. These have all been given to me in unstinted quantity. I can never express the heart of my gratitude for it all. Be as ready to help the other who is perhaps the greater sufferer. With love to all, Voltaren declare. So, Voltaren declare literally raised funds for the guy who just shot her. Um, pleaded with the relevant authorities to give him amnesty and not prison and to help him and refused to officially identify Helter at her hospital bed and said that she did not know him and recognized him as a comrade. Um, so, um, Helter's bullets would never be removed from her body and while there are no definitive answers to how this affected her health, it's safe to say that this did cause her a bit of pain throughout the rest of her life. I'm not sure what they were made of. Um, I do know that she lived through them and that it wasn't the biggest reason why she died. Um, Volturin would, as time goes on, become more and more radical in her politics. Um, she would start speaking in favor of organizations like the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, um, which is a uh, non-governmental uh, union. Uh, it's always been radically independent from government, um, and it's actually an organization I really like and I really want to read more upon. So. Um, I think they're a great organization, personally. Yeah, uh, and uh, she started talking in favor of direct action uh, and the Mexican Revolution, and even violence against people to some degree, or another revolutionary violence. Uh, and while I don't want to get too much into this because this is debated whether she got became an anarcho-communist later in her life or she didn't. Um, I, uh, it is it is interesting to talk about why she changed so radically. So I will discuss this a little bit. You know, why did she move so leftward? Uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing to me. But why did she change so much? What was she still an anarchist of the agitators, or had she given up for anarcho-communism? This is an interesting question and something I think should really be talked about more. And I actually want to write an essay about. But for now, I'm not going to explain the question too much because they're all really big questions. And I think it's better to mull over over them than draw any hard and fast conclusions about whether Declare was an anarcho-communist or an anarchist without adjectives. Um, because it's my personal belief that after, after you know, mulling, over, mulling it over a little bit, at least here and there, and thinking about her previous years, she was really depressed. Like, basically, I don't want to get into this period of her life, but she was really depressed years before. And um, she had basically hit rock bottom. She didn't know if liberty was the right thing or if, um, if there was any point to anarchism or doing any of this. Um, she, she lost a lot of her hope in a lot of things because basically everything she knew kept dying. Uh, Dyer D. Lum died. Um, she had a chronic illness that kept affecting her again and again. She was always in abject poverty. Um, she had a very weak constitution. She was just, you know, it was a lot of pressure and eventually it got to her. Um, um, it, it's debated. I've heard that it was uh, sort of uh, I, an STD. I've also heard it was an, uh, an uh, anomia. Uh, I don't know, a sort of like um, in, inflammation of the sinuses, I believe it was. But I, I heard it was also an STD. Um, I'm not sure though. So, but I'm, what I'm also unsure about is how sincere she was about all these things, because she had gone so such to uh, to such a low level in her life. I don't know. It's it's interesting to think about whether she just grabbed the first rope she saw, because the Mexican Revolution happened, and then she was back on board with the anarchism. She was like, "Yeah, we got to support the Mexican Revolution. We got to do this. We got to do that." She raised funds. She did organizations. She did speeches um, for, for the Mexican for the Mexican Revolution. She wrote a poem called "Written in Red," which is actually her last poem before she died. So she was clearly very invested in this in this revolution, but how genuinely in invested was she, or was it just that she didn't want to be in despair anymore and she wanted to cling on to something? So that's an interesting question I'll pose. I don't have the answer, uh, although I tend to think that it was something like that. Though I do think she was considerably genuine, but I also think that it might have been out of desperation. Nevertheless, her essay, Direct Action, is one of her finest, and I certainly recommend it. I think it's an essay we can all learn much from, uh, and I. No, we actually don't have it, but it's one of her, one of her really good essays. 
Uh, and this transition or belief should be analyzed more, like I said before. Um, whatever the case, and I want to wrap up who Volterim was, I got a few more sections, but they're not too long. Uh, Volterim would tragically die at the age of 45 on June 20th, 1912. So this is 100 years, late, 100 years earlier. Due to a chronic illness that had plagued her almost her entire life, her funeral was very well attended. I believe it had a thousand or more people, uh, which was very impressive given such a figure that she was. I mean, she was big in the anarchist movement, but that's like saying, you know, you're big in a really underground music scene or something. I don't know. It, it's it's not it's not as impressive as you. Waitress at Denny's. What? Waitress at Denny's. A waitress at Denny's, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, Alexander Berkman, uh, an anarcho-communist, helped construct her selected works, which is one of her uh, collected works I unfortunately do not have, uh, but I'm working on getting that, um, of which includes her sketches, poetry, and of course some of her more popular essays. Unfortunately, the U.S. government during this time, God, I couldn't hate the government anymore, right? Uh, seized most of the copies of the, this publication because she was probably one of the better known anarchists during that time. Uh, Sartwell, uh, a co-editor of The Exquisite Rebel, um, this is this is the thing that he co-edited. It's a collection of essays. Um, says that it's not it's not that surprising because uh, again, as I said, she was one of the most sought-after anarchists at the time. Uh, as you might guess, this didn't help Voltaire to be remembered down the road because you know government stole most of her freaking work and Voltaire never re wrote a book she always wrote uh, essays and sketches and, p and small publications but she never wrote a book uh, and to add to that, Voltaire was something of a recluse. Uh, she was very much introverted, and outside of a small circle of friends, she wasn't really uh, involved with the larger anarchist scene. I mean, she was, but um, not as much as people like Emma Goldman was, let's put it like that. Uh, and she was definitely more of a writer than a speaker, she said so herself. She always felt that she was definitely less of an orator and more of a writer. Um, and she was typically uh, restricted from admitting, not physically, but uh, not physically outwardly, but inwardly, due to health problems or lack of money or something else. Um, but in the end, one of the biggest reasons, of course, that Volterine is still not very well remembered today was that her tragic death happened at an even more tragically young age. Um, because of this and other reasons stated, Volterine declared wouldn't be remembered for the pro most part, not even in the anarchist movement. Um, so I want to talk about now why we should celebrate Voltaren. Um and I want to kind of debate a few points that I've heard from other people raise about Voltaren and, and a lack of originality and a few other points. Um, so, but if Voltaren was so easily f forgotten, maybe there's good reason for it, right? Maybe, uh, I mean, Voltaren lived in the early the late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, so, what lessons could she have to give us that other anarchists like, you know, Goldman or Tucker or Spooner or all these other anarchists could have given us? Um, surely, you know, all these people who are better remembered than she than she is, at least within the anarchist context. And even Emma Goldman's known outside of the anarchist context. She's really popular. Uh, well, popular. Um, and so perhaps there is a reason for it. But I don't believe there's any good reason why we should forget Voltaire. Uh, and I really haven't heard one, let alone dismiss her work or call it unoriginal. But me seeing that, thinking that she is original is actually uh, something I want to talk about because I've heard the claim that she is unoriginal. I kind of want to briefly dispute that claim because I think that if we do allow the claim that she's unoriginal in her work, then obviously people are going to be a little bit more disinterested in reading her work. I mean, if she's not original, why bother reading her work? So, um, Jeff Rigenbach, in his piece, Volterine Declare, Penitent Priestess of Anarchism, this is only one of the two pieces I'm going to cite that have priestess in it. Um, he says, quote, As a libertarian, Volterine <coughs> strong suit was not original thought. It was distilling and, pl and packaging the original thought of others. She was, in Friedrich Hayek's sense of the word, an intellectual. That is, a professional, quote, second-hand dealer in ideas. Such figures rarely command much uh, fame outside the, uh, the compass of their own lifetimes. So, uh, I, I very strongly dispute that point. Uh, but, to be fair to Riggenbach, he's not claiming this isn't a reason to, uh, to not read Voltaire. He's not saying that. But merely pointing out a flaw he saw in her general style or works. Uh, 
But regardless of Rigoboxing intent, if this claim was true, as I've said before, it certainly lead credence to the idea that we shouldn't read her and she's not important to read. Uh, thus, I want to briefly rebuke this claim, and it's actually not that hard to do, because for starters, he cites Voltaire's piece, Anarchism in American Traditions. Now, obviously, Anarchism in American Traditions is going to cite a lot of other works. If we're talking about traditions, and we're talking about values that come from the past, then we're going to be talking about other writers and their thoughts and how they've affected her. So it's kind of a specious claim from the get-go to kind of cite that article out of all others. Not to mention, he doesn't cite any other articles that are actually apparently unoriginal in his mind. So, um, he doesn't give any actual attempt to cite anything by her. He just says, well, there's this one essay and it's unoriginal, and he doesn't really back it up. It's just a passing statement, but it's a passing statement that really bothers me. Because if you're going to say a writer throughout the entire time of her life was unoriginal, you, I feel like you should really back that up. Um, so, uh, he, does, he does have this quote by Eugenia de Lamotte, who says that she isn't original either, though says that she was... Uh, amazing, uh, brilliant, and she was still brilliant in her speeches and wonderfully cogent, but only in referencing one of her works and not mentioning any others and merely making a general dismissive comment towards her. I don't really find Riggenbach has made a strong foundation for his claim. And it's even weaker because if we look at her other works like Sex Slavery, The Dominant Idea, her essay on anarchism, The Individualist and the Communist, and delve deeper into her sketches and stories and poems, I think that we find an amazingly original speaker. Like, yeah, she wrote a lot of poetry. Uh, <laughs> we can see in her essay, Sex Slavery, a highly modern critique of gender relations, marriage, the state, the church, and more. We can see in the dominant idea, a heavily poetic, historical, and proto-existentialist uh, thought process that leads Voltaire to anarchism way before uh, Sartre. Um, in her essay, Anarchism, her prose is beyond reproach in my, in my mind, besides perhaps being a little overly cumbersome in some sections. And her treatment of the many different schools uh, of anarchism certainly stood out among the more sectarian people like Tucker himself, which is another reason why she ended up not liking him. It, it, she had a kind of a cold feeling to him later in her life. Uh, and the individualist and the communist, as I noted before, is notable for its use of dialogue contrasting and comparing both sides of the story. Um, it's true that the communist is usually asking instead of stating, the, uh, stating answers, but there are definitely both sides are given. She's giving a, a pretty fair side, a pretty fair hearing to both sides, I think. Um, in her sketches and poetry, Volstein is wonderfully original and powerful in her demands for change and both hope and despair for humanity. In her sketches, she would use many different sorts of writing techniques, metaphors, plays on ironic twists to expose various types of oppression, sometimes interlocking and sometimes just separate things in them themselves. And her poems vary from political, the hurricane, the road builders, written in red, etc., to being on free thought, the gods and the people, the free thinkers plea, the burial, burial of my past self, to simply being about herself, and thou too, loves ghosts, life or death, etc., and so on. So suffice to say, I think you get the point. I don't think that the claim that Voltaire was original is actually a very credible claim, and I don't think it has any weight. Perhaps if you only selectively read her work, or merely just dip your feet in her work and never go any further, then you, then you can claim that she was unoriginal. And though I can't say for sure, I think Riggenbach did not do all the research that, on her life that she could have, that he could have. And that's not to say I don't appreciate him, his works on Voltaire or whatever, because his article or his video has about over, I think, 400 views on YouTube, and uh, his article probably has way more. Um, so he's probably gotten, I don't know how many people to, to know about Voltaire, and for that I'm like eternally grateful. Anybody who does that in a moderately fair way, like he did, you know, I have some problems with his article, but you know, um, <laughs> uh, even so, I still, I still appreciate what he did. Um, and I want to maintain that just like Sartwell does, uh, that I, that I want to keep the rec that she was a brilliant, passionate writer and original thinker, so. Uh, and originality is a reason to celebrate her, so, so that's, that's the whole point of talking about that, that to celebrate her is to celebrate her originality, and certainly not to think that she's unoriginal. Her imagina uh, imagination, creativity, and combining prose and harsh critiques of modern day society, whether that be on the issues of gender, or labor, the state, and the individual, or the church and the individual, um, and more, are just really great to read. Uh, and although I haven't touched on it, mu on it much, uh, it should be obvious by now that Voltaire was, was an atheist, uh, not only an anarchist, but an atheist and a feminist. Um, and that these are even more reasons to celebrate Voltaire, though I don't want to get too into them. Um, 
and it, it's because really that her critique was so far reaching by that point because even if you're just critiquing the state you're you're being expansive but if you create critique modern gender roles critique you know the church um, and the church certainly was its own thing that even a hundred years ago um, and I, and I'd still contest it still partly is um, it's it's really um, it, it's really impressive how she put spent a lot of her time critiquing the same institution that had scarred her soul, as she put it, uh, being that being the church when she was younger, and something that a lot of fe that feminists wouldn't do was critique the state, and she did that. She did that openly, um, and she went as far actually to cr to criticize or question whether the way children are brought up is actually um, natural. She says, "quote Look how your children grow up, taught from their earliest infancy to curb their love." Uh, nature is restrained at every turn. Your blasting lies would even blacken a child's kiss. Little girls must not be tomboyish, must go barefoot, must not climb trees, must not learn to swim, must not do anything they desire to which, out, which Madame Grundy has uh, decreed improper. Little boys are laughed at effeminate, silly girl boys if they want to make patchwork or play with a doll. Then when they grow up people say, oh men, they don't care for home or children as women do. Why should they when the, when the deliberate effort of your life has been to crush that nature out of them? And people say women can't rough it like men. Train any animal or any plant as you train your girls, and it won't be able to rough it either. Um, so she had some pretty harsh uh, words. Uh, even today, people can learn from this criticism of the way children are brought up. And it, of course, brings up the ever-present debate of nature versus nurture, which which one impacts more or whatever. And Voltrine obviously, is uh, going with nurture here. Um, but whatever her, her position is, um, it's uh, it's interesting to note how far she does really go with her critiques, and individually individuality and responsibility are important parts of, of libertarianism. So if we want to have that, we got to be responsible with what we teach our children. If we decide to have any, or what are we going to show them? Are we going to show them television? Are we going to show them some of the commercials that are clearly geared towards? They they, they split up genders in this really narrow and, and box like fashion. I feel um, that really isolate people from each other and, and make the gender. I think harder to relate to each other. Um, you know, I don't have any big like theory or philosophy on this, but it's just kind of my my outward feeling from from watching other people talk about these issues. Um, so if we want to take care of ourselves and we want to be responsible for ourselves, we've got to be responsible for, the, for our children because they're very impressionable and, you know, what do we want to teach them? Uh, Voltaire's critique of marriage, and it's funny I'm mentioning that because there's a, there's a wedding today, so this is going to be a fun section to talk about. Uh, she had a, a strong critique of marriage, which I actually share, so sorry, I don't get excited about marriages. Uh, she opposes government and religious sponsored marriages, of course, that's a given. But she goes further and says that the whole foundation of marriage itself is subject to questioning if not outright dismissal uh, in terms of a critique, not dismissing it out of hand. In her essay, Those Who Marry Do Ill, and she says that, quote, by marriage I mean the real thing, the permanent relation of men and women, sexual and economical, whereby the present home and family life is maintained. It is of no importance to me whether this be polygamous, polyandric, or monogamous marriage, nor whether it's blessed by a priest, permitted by the magistrate, contracted publicly or privately, or not contact contracted at all. It is the permanent dependent relationship which I affirm is detrimental to the growth of individual character and to which I am unequivocally opposed. Now my opponents know where to find me. So, um, she certainly defined her terms pretty well, I think. Uh, and I, I have a lot of sympathies towards that position, actually, but I don't want to... That, that's a whole another rabbit hole that I don't want to go down. Um, until tomorrow. Yeah, well, <laughs> until tomorrow or some other time. Her words touch on issues still relevant to the day that actually put a more radical and, in my opinion, better approach to the recent and still ongoing debates about gay marriage. Um, based on this quote, I don't think Voltaire would necessarily... I'm not saying she would, be saying that equality before the law, especially in such a harmful institution as marriage, are worth much of our atten attention. Now maybe in the short run, limited efforts being put towards equalizing the privileges marriage has given to straight, white, and heterosexual relations might be good, uh, would be given to gays, but both three most likely see no good reason why. Actually, I don't either. After all, it's the assumption that such relations can last till death do us a uh, part, with no way to actually make that journey very enjoyable outside a relationship that combines both participants' space, individuality, and the existence of the freeness. Now, this isn't a universal claim. I'm sure people can love each other within a context of being married. I'm not disputing that. But as Emma Goldman said in her essay, uh, Marriage and Love, this is typically not because of marriage, but in spite of it, in my opinion. Uh -huh. and, uh, also in her opinion, obviously. So, um, But it's, it's fair to point out that 100 years ago, marriage was a very different institution. Men basically owned women. And I'm not kidding when they owned. They could, you know, whip.
whip women or they could demean them or they could, yeah, by, yeah, the rule of thumb. Um, and they could basically do whatever they want and mar- uh, sex within, forceful sex within a context of marriage was not rape, it was just sex. Um, so when Boltrine says sex slavery, she wasn't talking about like some sort of sex slavery trade. She's talking about the modern institution, in her time, modern institution of marriage that literally had sexual relations be a sort of slavish type. Um, now, obviously, that's not the case right now, at least not to such an extent. How do you think but she would have felt now? I think she still would have felt opposed to marriage because what she was opposing wasn't even the fact that that was going on. I mean, obviously, she did oppose that, but those were just add-ons. She felt like um, she kind of felt like Sartre did, uh, Jean Paul Sartre, a later existentialist thinker. Um, he thought that basically couples should live in their own apartments or have their own space um, because it increases individuality and that they should also be sort of free to have multiple relationships uh, as long as they know, I think as long as they know what's, if it's going on. I'm not sure if they were polyamorous or something else. That would be uh, cool. Do you actually know if um, Valterine wrote any essays on homosexuals such as Emma Goldman did? I don't think she did. I, I think she actually wrote one sketching about black, uh, about the racial oppression that black people had, which is interesting because Emma Goldman didn't do that. Huh. Um, but Emma Goldman might have her on, on the homosexuality thing because I don't think Goldman really wrote about that. Yeah. I mean, it's not surprising. I mean, even anarchists, a lot of them didn't talk about those kind of issues. And even a lot of the free love kind of people... A lot of people didn't talk about it until the 70s. Right, exactly. And a lot of people who, who were even in the free love anarchist movement didn't talk about a guy on girl, or didn't talk about guy with guy or girl with girl. It was, you know, heterosexual. Um, and, you know, it, that, that's still a sort of part of it that's still a little bit less than radical. Man, I hope I have a USB drive. Um, I'm at like 12%. Given her concern for the individuals and their freedom or lack thereof, she was also interested in criticizing those that would break away from some institutions but not others. So she would do this with the free thinkers. Um, in, her, in her essay, which I, like said, was really good, uh, The Economic Tendency of Free Thought, she says, and there's a bit of a long quote, so sorry. She says, I, the religious question is dead and the, and the stake is no longer fashionable, but it's a strong state, a brave state, a conscious, proud state, whose authority demands the death of five creatures, the Haymarket defendants, or, or rather, she asks the question, whose authority demands the death of five creatures who happen to be the, or who are the Haymarket defendants? Is the scaffold better than the faggot? Is it a very free mind which will read that infamous editorial in the Chicago Herald? Quote, it is not necessary to hold that Parsons was legally, rightfully, or wisely hanged. He was mightily hanged. The state, the sovereign, need give no reason. The state abide by no law. The state is the law. Apparently someone actually wrote that. I can't even believe that. To read that and applaud and set the cane-like curse upon your forehead and the red damned spot upon your band. Do you know what you do? Craven, you worship the fiend authority again. True, you may not have the ghosts, the incantations, the paraphernalia, and the mummery of the church. No, but you have the prudence, the be it, the be it enacted, the red tape, the official uniforms of the state, and you are just as bad a slave to a statecraft as, you are, as your Irish Catholic neighbors is to Popecraft. You, again, there's with the Catholics. Your, your government becomes your God, from whom you accept privileges and whose hands, uh, whose hands all rights are vested. Once more, the individual has no rights. Once more, intangible, irresponsible authority assumes the power of deciding what is right and what is wrong. Once more, the race must labor under just such restricted conditions as the law, the voice of authority, the governmentalist Bible shall dictate. Once more, it says, you, have not been, you who have not meat, be grateful that you have bread. Many are not allowed even so much. You who have worked 16 hours a day. Be glad it is not 20. Many have not the privilege to work. You have not fuel. Be thankful that you have shelter. Many walk the street. And you street walkers, be grateful that there are, well, um... Oh, good. I'm like page 13 of 16. Be thankful for your goad. Be submissive to the Lord and kiss the hand that lashes you. So as we can see, you know, so on and so forth, uh, Voltaire was uh, spared nothing towards her fellow free thinkers. And it's not only that. It's not only what she thought, but what she did. And really, I, I even noticed a few people were, were blown away from what she did with Helcher. And I, and I think that's really the biggest thing, one of the biggest things she did in her life, is that she had such a good response to it. She lived by her principles. I, I hesitate to say who would live by their 
the principles so much that somebody shoots you three times and you don't sue them. You don't try to put them in jail. You defend them. You raise money for them. You call them a comrade. You say that they're mentally ill and that they need help. They don't need prison. Um, and Helcher shooting actually was a blessing in disguise in a way because it led to Voltaire writing one, probably one of her best essays, Crime and Punishment. Uh, and it's, a very, it's a pretty uh, lengthy essay, but it's also very good. And she basically says, calls for the abolition of prison. Um, on the whole scale, on the wholesale. Her biggest accomplishment was her response to Helcher. And she could have so easily testified him. She could have so easily identified him, gotten money, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and I just want to talk about conclusions. So why is Voltrine a priestess of anarchism? Well, it seems almost sort of a joke, doesn't it, that Voltrine could be called a priestess because in some manner or another, given her distaste for uh, religion and the church, but nevertheless, she was something of a priestess. She was, as Sartwell points out in the article, Voltrine declared priestess of pity and ve uh, vengeance. She, quote, internalized the modesty and asceticism of the church, of the convent. Most pictures of her in her later li life show her in a plain, high neck garb that could almost be called a habit. And in a life of extreme fr frugality and devotion to her calling mirrored that of the nuns who helped raise her, and quote, and another quote, was often referred to by her acquaintances in religious terms as priestess. Leonard D. Abbott called her the priestess of pity and vengeance, for, or the bride, bride of her cause. She was moreover very passionate about her uh, beliefs, and especially anarchism, calling her concept of anarchism being the sort of first truth or axiom, like I already talked about, from which all other conclusions followed. She followed this quote, axiom of anarchy, passionately almost all of her life. She did this through near constant writing, speaking, and donating to different causes, and though her constitution was typically weak, she did this constantly. Voltarine lived in a uh, nearly completely ascetic lifestyle, as Startwell mentions. She lived a very simple lifestyle in near perpetual poverty and even went so, as far as to criticize Emma Goldman for her fascination with talking to upper middle class and bourgeoisie kind of people. Um, and, uh, and in The Dominant Idea, she, uh, which is one of her fan, um, proto existentialist essays, really good, um, she uh, rejects thing worship and calls it one of the biggest problems of the day. And anarchism, thing worship. Oh. And anarchism in American traditions, Fulstrine comes off as a sort of neo-transcendentalist in the, in the sort of strain of Emerson and Thoreau. Uh, and whatever the case may be, whether she was a penitent priestess or a priestess of pity and vengeance, there's no doubt in my mind that Voltrine should be better remembered than she currently is. Her pity for those around her will cry for a philosophical uprising, which would result in vengeance for those who killed the martyrs, though not necessarily a violent vengeance, uh, makes Voltrine truly an interesting figure worth revisiting time and time again. So that is my introductory speech. Oh.